Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weyenberg. Tonight, we start our reading of Village Christmas by Miss Reed. The darkness throbbed with the clamor of church bells. The six sonorous voices of St. Patrick's peal chased each other, now in regular rhythm, now in staccato clashes, as the bell ringers sweated at their Christmas peal practice. The night was iron cold. Frost glittered on the hedges and fields of Fairacre, although it was not yet eight o'clock. Thatched roofs were furred with white rime beneath a sky brilliant with stars. Smoke rose in unwavering blue wisps from cottage chimneys, for the air was uncannily still. The sound of the bells carried far in such weather. At Beach Green, three miles away, Miss Clare heard them clearly as she stooped to put her empty milk bottle tidily on her cottage doorstep, and she smiled at the cheerful sound. She knew at least four of those six bell ringers, for she had taught them their lessons long ago at Fairacre School. Arthur Coggs, furtively setting rabbit snares by a copse near Springbourne, heard them as clearly. The shepherd, high on the downs above the village, and the lonely signalman tending his oil lamps on the branch line, which meandered along the Cax Valley to the market town, heard them too. Nearer at hand, in the village of Fairacre, the bells caused more positive reactions. The rooks, the, the rooks, roosting in the topmost boughs of the elm trees hard by the reverberating belfry, squawked an occasional protest at this disturbance. A fox, slinking toward Mr. Willett's hen run, thought better of it as the bells rang out and beat a retreat to the woods. Mrs. Pringle, the dower cleaner of Fairacre School, picked up a flake of whitewash with disgust from the spotless floor where it had fluttered from the quaking kitchen wall, and a new baby nearby, awakened by the clamor, wailed its alarm. Miss Margaret Waters and her sister Mary were quietly at work in their cottage in the village street. They sat one each side of the big round table in the living room, penning their Christmas cards in meticulous copper plate. Music tinkled from large old-fashioned wireless set on the dresser by the fireplace, vying with the noise of the bells outside. Mary's gray curls began to nod in time to a waltz, and putting her pen between her teeth, she rose to increase the volume of the music. At that moment, an excruciating clash of St. Patrick's peal informed the world of Fairacre that at least three of the six bell ringers were hopelessly awry in their order. Switch it off, Mary, do. Them dratted bells drowns anything else. We may as well save the electric, exclaimed Margaret, looking over the top of her gold-rimmed spectacles. Mary obeyed, as she always did, and returned to her seat. It would have been very nice, she thought privately, to hear the merry widow waltz all the way through, but it was not worth upsetting Margaret, especially with Christmas so near. After all, it was the season of goodwill. She picked up a card from the central pile and surveyed it with affection. All right for Cousin Toby, she queried, her head on one side. He's partial to a robin. Her sister looked up from her writing and studied the card earnestly. Sending just the right card to the right person was something which both sisters considered with the utmost care. Their Christmas cards had been chosen from the most modestly priced counter at Bell's and Cax the Caxley Stationer, but even so, but even so, the amount had been a considerable sum from the weekly pension of the two elderly sisters. You don't feel it's a mite spangly? That glitter on the icicles don't look exactly manly to me. I'd say the coach and horses myself. Mary set the robin aside reluctantly and began to inscribe the card with the coach and horses from your affectionate cousins, Margaret and Mary. The ancient mahogany clock, set four square in the middle of the mantelpiece, ticked steadily as it had done throughout their parents' married life and their own single one. A log hissed on the small open fire and the black kettle on the trivet began to hum. By bedtime, it would be boiling, ready for the sisters' hot water bottles. It was very peaceful and warm in the cottage, and Mary sighed with content as she tucked in the flap of Cousin Toby's envelope. It was the time of day she loved best, when the work was done, the curtains were drawn, and she and Margaret sat snugly and companionably by the fire. That seems to be the lot, she observed, putting the envelopes into a neat stack. Margaret added her last one. 
three, including the rejected Robin, remained unused. There's bound to be someone we've forgot, said Margaret. Put them all on the dresser, dear, and we'll post them off tomorrow. The church bells stopped abruptly and the room seemed very quiet. Ponderously and melodiously, the old clock chimed half past eight from the mantelpiece and Mary began to yawn. At that moment, there came a sharp rapping at the door. Mary's mouth closed with a snap. Who on earth can that be at this time of night, she whispered. Her blue eyes were round with alarm. Margaret, made of sterner stuff, strode to the door and flung it open. There, blinking in the sudden light, stood a little girl. Come in, do, out of the cold, begged Mary, who had followed her sister. Why, Vanessa, you haven't got a coat on. You must be starved with cold. Come by the fire now. The child advanced toward the blaze, plump hands outstretched like pink starfish. She sniffed cheerfully and beamed up at the two sisters, who looked down at her with so much concern. The child's two front milk teeth had recently vanished, and the gap gave her wide her wide smile a gammon air. She shook the silky fringe from her sparkling eyes. Clearly, Miss Vanessa Emery was very happy to be inside Flint Cottage. And what do you want, my dear, so late in the day? inquired Margaret, unusually gentle. Mummy sent me, explained the child. She said you could let, she said, could you lend her some string to tie up Grandpa's parcel? Thick string, she said, if you could manage it. It's a box of apples you see off our tree, and sticky tape won't be strong enough on its own. Indeed it won't, agreed Mary, opening the dresser drawer and taking out a square tin. She opened it and placed it on the table for the child to inspect. Inside were neat coils of string, the thickest at the left-hand side and the finest, some of it as thin as thread, in a tidy row on the right hand. The child drew in her breath with delight and put a finger among the coils. Where did you buy it? she asked. Buy it? echoed Margaret, flabbergasted. Buy string? We never bought a bit of string in all our borns. Comes off all the parcels that have come here over the years. Mum cuts ours off and throws it away, explained the child, unabashed. She picked up a fat, gingery coil of hairy twine and examined it closely. Could you spare this? she asked politely. Of course, of course, said Mary, hurrying to make amends for the horrified outburst from her sister. She tucked it into the pocket on the front of the child's cotton apron. And now I'll see you across the road, she added, opening the front door. It's so late, I expect you should be in bed. The child left the fire reluctantly. One hand gripped a string inside her pocket. The other she held out to Margaret. Good night, Miss Waters, she said carefully, and thank you for the string. You're welcome, replied Margaret, shaking the cold hand. Mind the road now. The two sisters watched the child run across to the cottage opposite. It sat well back from the village street in a little hollow surrounded by an overgrown garden. Against the night sky, its thatched roof and two chimneys gave it the air of a great cat crouched comfortably on its haunches. They heard the gate bang and turned again to their fire, slamming the door against the bitter cold. Well, exploded Margaret, fancy sending a child out at this time of night, and for a bit of string. Cuts it off indeed. Did you ever hear of such a wicked waste, Mary? Dreadful, agreed her sister, but with less vehemence, and that poor little mite with no coat on. Well, I've always said there's some people as have no business to be parents, and them Emery's belong to them. Three under seven and another on the way, it's far too many. I feel downright sorry for that poor unborn. She can't look after the three she's got already. Margaret picked up the poker and rapped smartly at a large lump of coal. It split obediently and burst into joyous flame. The kettle purred with increased vigor and Margaret moved it further back on the trivet. The two sisters sat down, one at each side of the blaze. From the cupboard under the dresser, Mary drew forth a large bundle, unrolled it, and gave one end to Margaret. They were making a hearth rug, a gigantic monster of Turkish design in crimson and deep blue. Each evening, the sisters spent some time thrusting their shining hooks in and out of the canvas as they laboriously added strand after strand of bright wool. Margaret's end was growing much more quickly than Mary's. Her hook moved more briskly with sharp staccato jabs and the wool was tugged fiercely into place. Mary moved more slowly and she fingered each knotted strand as though she loved it. She would be sorry when the work was done. Margaret would be glad. 
I must say they seem happy enough, observed Mary, reverting to the topic of the Emerys, and very healthy too. They're dear little girls and so polite. Did you notice the way Vanessa shook hands? It's not the children I'm criticizing, replied Margaret, it's their parents. There'll be four little mites under that roof soon, and dear knows how many more to come. And they don't seem to have any idea of bringing them up right. Look at their fancy names, for one thing. Vanessa, Francesca, Anna Louise, I ask you. I rather like them, said Mary with spirit. Margaret snorted and jabbed the canvas energetically. And all dressed up in that frilly little apron with a heart-shaped pocket and no decent warm coat on the child's back, continued Margaret, now in full spate. It's all on a par with the house. All fancy lampshades and knickknacks hanging on the walls and great holes in the sheets for all to see when she hangs them on the line. Twasn't no surprise to me to hear she cuts up her string and throws it out. We done right, Mary, not to get too familiar with her. She's the sort as would be in here everlasting borrowing, given half a chance, as I told you at the outset. I dare say you're right, dear, responded Mary equably. She usually was, thought Mary pensively. They worked in silence, and Mary looked back to the time when the Emerys had first arrived in Fairacre, three months before, and she had watched from a vantage point behind the bedroom curtain their furniture being carried up the brick path. It was a golden afternoon in late September, and Margaret had gone to St. Patrick's to help with the decorations for Harvest Festival. A bilious headache had kept Mary from accompanying her, and she had retired to bed with an aspirin and a cup of tea. She had slept for an hour, and the sound of children's voices woke her. At first, she thought the school children must be running home, but it was only three o'clock by the flowering china timepiece on the mantel shelf, and she had gone to the window to investigate. A dark green pantechnicon almost blocked the village street. The men were staggering to the house opposite with a large and shabby sideboard between them. Two little girls danced excitedly beside them, piping shrilly to each other like demented moorhens. Their mother, cigarette in mouth, watched the proceedings from the side of the doorway. Mary was a little shocked, not by the cigarette, although she felt that smoking was not only a wicked waste of money but also very unhealthy, but at the young woman's attire. She wore black tights with a good-sized hole in the left leg and a short scarlet jerkin which ended at mid-thigh. Her black hair was long and straight, and her eyes were heavily made up. To Mary, she appeared like an actress about to take part in a play set in the Middle Ages. No one, absolutely no one, dressed like that in Fairacre, and Mary only hoped that the young woman would not hear the remarks which must inevitably come from such village stalwarts as Mrs. Pringle and her own sister if she continued to dress in this manner. Nevertheless, Mary was glad to see that they had neighbors, and gladder still to see that there were children. The thatched cottage had stood empty all the summer, ever since the old couple who had lived there from the time of their marriage in good Queen Victoria's range, reign had departed to a daughter's house in Caxley and had moved from thence to Fairacre churchyard. It would be good to see a light winking through the darkness again from the cottage window and to see the neglected garden put into order once more, thought Mary. Her headache was gone, and she straightened the bed coverlet and made her way down the steep, dark staircase. She was pleasantly excited by the activity outside the front door and tried to hear what the children were saying, but in vain. A thin wailing could be heard, and peeping out from behind the curtain, Mary saw that the woman now had a baby slung over her shoulder and was patting its back vigorously. Three, breathed Mary with delight. She was devoted to children and thoroughly enjoyed taking her Sunday school class. To be sure, she was often put out when some of the bigger boys were impudent and was quite incapable of disciplining them, but small children, and particularly little girls of gentle upbringing, delighted her warm old spinster's heart. When Margaret returned, she told her the good news. Her sister received it with some reserve. I'll be as pleased as you are, she assured Mary, if they behave themselves. Let's pray they ain't the squalling sort. You can hear too much in that bedroom of ours when the wind's that way. I wondered, began Mary timidly, if it would be a kindness to ask him over for a cup of tea when we makes it. If she was alone, replied Margaret, after a moment's consideration, I'd say yes, but with three children and the removal men too, I reckons we'd be overdone. Best leave it, Mary, but it does you credit to have thought of it. Mary was about to answer, but Margaret went on. 
Her expression was cautious. We don't want to be too welcoming yet a while, my dear. Let's see how they turn out. Being neighborly is one thing, but living in each other's pockets is another. Let him get settled and then we'll call. Best not to go too fast or we'll find ourselves babysitting every evening. She, a thought struck her. Seen the man, Mary? Mary admitted she had not. Funny, ruminated her sister. You'd have thought he'd be on hand. Maybe he's clearing things up at the other end, suggested Mary. Maybe, agreed Margaret. I only hope and pray she's not a widow woman, or worse still, one that's been, been left. We'll know soon, replied Mary comfortably, well versed in village ways. Fairacre had a lively grapevine, and there would be no secrets unhidden in the cottage opposite. The sisters felt quite sure. Within a week, it was common knowledge that the Emerys had moved from a North London suburb, Enfield, according to Mrs. Pringle, Southgate, by Mr. Willett's reckoning, though the vicar was positive that it was Barnet. Much to Margaret's relief, Mr. Emery had appeared, and her first glimpse of him was as he put out the milk bottles the next morning, while still clad in dashing crimson pajamas with yellow frogging. He worked up the Atomic, as did many other Fairacre residents, but drove there at a shabby old Daimler at about nine, instead of going on the bus which collected the other workers at 7.30 each morning. One of the high ups, commented Mr. Willett, had a bit of book, book learning and science in that, I don't doubt. Looks scruffy enough to have a degree to my mind, wants a new razor blade by the looks of things, and that duffel coat has seen a few meals down it. Fairacre was inclined to agree with Mr. Willett's somewhat tart summing up of Mr. Emery, though the female residents pointed out that he seemed to take his share of looking after the children, and, say what you like, he was very attractive with thick black hair. It was Mrs. Emery who provided more fodder for gossip. As Mary had foreseen, her bohemian garments scandalized the older generation, and then she was so breathtakingly friendly. She had introduced herself to Mr. Lamb in the post office and to two venerable residents who were collecting their pensions, shaking hands with them warmly and asking such personal questions as where they lived and what were their names. Wonder she didn't ask us how old we be, said one to the other when they escaped into the open air. She be a baggage, I'll lay. I'll take good care to steer clear of that one. She hailed everyone she met with equal heartiness and struck horror into every conservative fair acre heart by announcing her decision to join every possible club and society in the village to get to know people, and her intention of taking the little girls with her if the times of the meetings proved suitable. Terribly important for them to make friends, she told customers and assistants in the village shop one morning. Her wide, warm smile embraced them all. She seemed unaware of a certain frostiness in the air as she made her purchases and bade them all goodbye with considerable gusto when she left. Margaret and Mary viewed their ebullient neighbor with some alarm. Three days after her arrival, when Margaret was already planning the best time to call, Mrs. Emery knocked briefly on the sister's front door and almost immediately opened it herself. Anyone at home, she chirped blithely, can I come in? Before the startled sisters could reply, she was in the room with two beaming little girls following her. I'm your new neighbor, as I expect you know, she said, smiling disarmingly. Diana Emery, this is Vanessa and this one's Francesca. Say hello, darlings. Hello, hello, piped the two children. Mary collected her wits with remarkable composure. She found the Emery family attractive, despite their forward ways. There now, she began kindly, we were wondering when to call and see you. Won't you take a cup of coffee? Margaret and I usually have some about this time. I'll get it, said Margaret swiftly, glad to escape from for a moment to take stock of the situation. Mary could see from her expression that she was not pleased by the invasion. Lovely, sighed Mrs. Emery, flinging off a loose jacket of jade green and settling into Margaret's armchair. The two little girls collapsed cross-legged on the hearth rug and gazed about them with squirrel-bright eyes beneath their silky fringes. What about the baby? asked Mary, concerned lest it should have been left outside. The morning was chilly. Not due until the new year, replied Mrs. Emery nonchalantly, and jolly glad I shall be when it's arrived. There was a gasp from the doorway as Margaret bore in the tray. She was pink and obviously put out. Mary hastened to explain, I meant the third little girl. Oh, Anna Louise, she's fast asleep in the pram, quite safe, I assure you. 
We want a brother next time, announced Vanessa, eyeing the plate of biscuits. Three girls is too many, announced Francesca. That's what my daddy says. That's a joke, explained Vanessa. Sometimes I wonder, their mother said, but her tone was cheerful. Margaret poured coffee and tried to avert her eyes from Mrs. Emery's striped frock, which gaped widely at the waist fastening, displaying an extraordinary undergarment of, crims of scarlet silk. Could it possibly be a petticoat, Margaret wondered? Were there really petticoats in existence of such a remarkable color? Mary did her best to make small talk. It was quite apparent that Margaret was suffering from shock and was of little help. Is there anything you want to know about the village? Perhaps you go to church sometimes. The services are 10.30 and 6.30. We're not much good at church going, admitted their neighbor, though I must say the vicar looks a perfect poppet. Margaret swallowed a mouthful of coffee too quickly and coughed noisily. This was downright sacrilege. Gone down the wrong way, explained Francesca, coming close to her and gazing up anxiously into Margaret's scarlet face. Speechless but touched by the child's solicitude, Margaret nodded. And if you want to go to Caxley, continued Mary, there is a bus timetable on the wall of the Beetle and Wedge. Is there anything else we can help you with? Mrs. Emery put her cup carelessly upon its saucer so the spoon crashed to the floor. Both children pounced upon it and returned it to the table. Well, yes, there is something, said their mother. Could you possibly change a check for me? I'm absolutely out of money and want to get some cigarettes. Edgar won't be home until eight or after. There was a chilly silence. The sisters had no banking account, and the idea of lending money, even to their nearest and dearest, was against their principles. To be asked by a stranger to advance money was profoundly shocking. Margaret found her tongue suddenly. I'm afraid we can't oblige. We keep very little in the house. I suggest you ask Mr. Lamb. He may be able to help. Her tone was glacial, but Mrs. Emery appeared unperturbed. Oh, well, she said cheerfully, struggling from the armchair and gaping even more hugely at the waistband. Never mind. I'll try Mr. Lamb, as you suggest. Must have a cigarette now and, ag now and again with this brood to look after. She picked up the green jacket and smiled warmly upon the sisters. Thank you so much for the delicious coffee. Do pop over and see us whenever you like. We'll probably be seeing quite a bit of each other as we're such close neighbors. And with these ominous words, she made her departure. Next time, we will return to the Christmas season and further developments with the Emerys.